In March of 1988, Nigel Lawson, who was then Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor of the Exchequer, brought the top rate of income tax in Britain down from 60 to 40 percent. Now that tax cut enlarged the net incomes of those whose incomes were already large in comparison with the British average and of course in comparison with the income of Britain's poor people. Socialists hated the tax cut and a recent Labour Party document says that Labour would put the tax back up again to, as it happens, 59%. Now, how might the Lawson tax cut and its unequalizing consequences be defended? Well, economic inequality is not a new thing in capitalist society, so there's been plenty of time for a lot of arguments to accumulate in favor of it. We hear from the political right that the wealth rich people have is the deserved fruit of their own effort and sacrifice, and also that even if they do not deserve their wealth, they are entitled to it because it was freely transferred to the currently rich by others who did deserve it or who were themselves entitled to it for some reason other than desert. And then there is the more popular proposition affirmed not only on the right but in the center, the proposition that inequality is justified because it dynamizes the economy and thereby increases the general happiness or anyway the gross national product. Now left-wing liberals whose chief representative in philosophy is John Rawls reject the desert entitlement and general utility arguments for inequality. They do not accept the principles which form the major premises of those arguments. But the right and center sometimes offer another argument for inequality to the major premise of which the liberals are friendly. That major premise is the principle that inequalities are justified when they render badly off people better off than they would be without the inequality in question. According to this argument for inequality, their high levels of income cause unusually productive people to produce more than they otherwise would. And as a result of the incentives enjoyed by those at the top, the people who end up near the bottom are better off than they would be in a more equal society. Left-wing liberals generally reject the factual claim that the vast inequalities that characterize Britain and America actually do benefit the badly off. But they tend to agree that if they did, then they would be justified. And they defend inequalities that really are justified by the explained incentive consideration. That is a major theme in the work of John Rawls. For Rawls, some people are, as a matter of genetic and other luck, capable of producing more than others are, and it's right to pay them more than others if the less fortunate are caused to be better off as a result. That policy is warranted by what Rawls calls the difference principle, the essence of which is on the sheet that I hope all of you have. This principle endorses all and only those social and economic inequalities that are good for the badly off or, more generously, those inequalities that either make the badly off better off or do not make them worse off. There is a certain ambiguity in Rawls on this matter of whether an inequality is acceptable if, although it does not help, it also does not hurt the badly off. But in what follows, I shall always take the difference principle in its more generous or more tolerant form in which it allows inequalities that do not help the badly off as long as these inequalities are innocuous with respect to their condition. Well, back now to the socialist egalitarians, the people who hated the loss in tax cut. Where do they stand with respect to the four patterns of justification of inequality that I briefly romped through? Well, being to the left of left-wing liberals, Socialist egalitarians are also inevitably going to be unimpressed 
by the arguments for inequality that left-wing liberals reject. That is, they're not going to be impressed by the desert, entitlement, and utility justifications of inequality. But it's not so easy for them to set aside the Rawlsian justification of inequality. That's something they have to wrestle with, and these two lectures are the product of my own wrestling with that justification. Socialists can't just dismiss the Rawlsian justification of inequality without lending to their own advocacy of equality a fanatical hue which they could not themselves, on reflection, find attractive. Let me explain why I say that. Socialist egalitarians asked what, their, what some of their fundamental principles are would, when listing them, likely say that among them, among such principles are equality. Everyone should be equal. We might well think that they count as egalitarians because equality is their premise. But I think that they misdescribe the, own, their, the springs of their own political passion when they say things like that. I believe that their primitive thought in the domain of principle that's of concern here is more complex than what the word equality suggests. I believe that the primitive thought of socialist egalitarians is why should these people be badly off when those other people are so well off? Notice that that's not the same as the colorless question why should these people be better off than those people? Because in that question, which is less complex in structure, there's no reference to absolute levels of condition, and therefore there's no reference to anyone being badly off, as opposed to just less well off than other people are. Maybe some egalitarians would maintain their zeal in a world consisting entirely of millionaires and billionaires, in which no one is badly off. In principles which they utter, commit them, as it were, to maintaining their zeal in such circumstances. But probably most egalitarians, and certainly the politically engaged socialist egalitarians that I have in mind, maybe they constitute a subspecies with peculiar characteristics, so let me restrict my claims to them and thereby make my claims immune to any counterexamples that you may have in mind. Um, these egalitarians have no easily discerned opinion about inequality at millionaire-billionaire levels. What they find wrong in our society, or indeed in our world, is that there is, so they think, unnecessary hardship at the lower end of the scale. What they find unacceptable is that there are people who are badly off and who they believe could be better off. They call for an equalizing redistribution, which, so they think, would lift those who are at the bottom. For these egalitarians, am I the right distance away from this microphone? Good. <clears throat> For these egalitarians, equality would be a good thing because it would make the badly off better off. They do not think it a good thing about equality that it would make the well off worse off. That isn't its point. And when their critics charge them, as they readily do, with being willing to grind everyone down to the level of the worst off, I mean, that's a familiar Tory criticism of the attitudes of supporters of the Labour Party in Britain, or even lower, that is, being willing to grind people down to the level of the worst off, or if necessary to achieve equality, even lower than that, they don't say in response the socialist egalitarians don't say in response to that claim about their attitudes, well, yes, let's grind all the way down if necessary, but let's achieve equality on a higher plane if that is possible. Instead, what they say is somewhat evasive at the level of principle. Typically, they just deny that it is necessary for the sake of achieving equality to move to a condition in which some are worse off and none are better off than now. Were they more reflective, they might add that if leveling down were necessary to achieve equality, then the appeal of equality would be tarnished. Because if leveling down is necessary, then either equality makes the badly off worse off still, 
in frustration of the original egalitarian purpose, or it makes the badly off no better off while others are made worse off to no good purpose or not at any rate in furtherance of the purpose inspiring these egalitarians in the first place if I am right that that purpose constitutively includes a sympathetic identification with and propensity to advocate, to advocate uh, an improvement in the condition of the badly off. Relative to their initial inspiration, which is a concern about badly off people, an inequality is mandatory if it really is needed to improve the condition of the badly off, and it is permissible, relative to that inspiration, if it does not improve, but also does not worsen their condition. So I say that these egalitarians lose sight of their goal, that their position becomes incoherent or untrue to itself, if they reject the difference principle and cleave to an egalitarianism of strict equality. Now we might conclude that these so-called egalitarians should not be called egalitarians because if I'm right in my characterization of their mindset, equality is not their real premise. But that conclusion would be hasty, the conclusion that, they, that it's wrong to call them egalitarians. And I'll say more about the propriety of the name egalitarian in a moment. Now, for my part, as should be evident from the attitude I've been manifesting, I accept the difference principle in its generous interpretation, but I question its application in defense of special money incentives to talented people. Rawlsians think that inequalities associated with such incentives satisfy the difference principle. But I believe that the idea that an inequality is justified if through the familiar incentive mechanism it benefits the badly off is more problematic than Rawlsians suppose. I think that when the incentive consideration is isolated, as it characteristically is in the rhetoric that I'm going to be criticizing, when it's isolated, from all considerations of desert or entitlement, then it creates an argument for inequality that requires a model of society that conflicts with the idea of community in a certain minimal sense of community that I'll be defining a little later in this, on in this lecture. A society in which the difference principle can be used to justify incentive inequalities I think is split or riven. It's a society in which the attitude of the talented people runs counter to the spirit of the difference principle itself. Accordingly, those talented people must be conceived as not themselves party to the principle when it's used to justify incentive payments to them. And I hope to persuade you that that casts a shadow on the incentive justification. Now, it may seem strange to accept the difference principle, the principle that inequalities are justified when they make badly off people better off, while questioning its use in defense of incentives. Because it might be thought that if the principle justifies any inequalities, then it justifies those that provide unequalizing incentives. Well, I'm not hostile to that conditional claim but I don't infer from it that if one accepts the principle, then one should countenance incentives-related inequalities. Because I believe that it's in general far more difficult than liberals think it is to justify an inequality at the bar of the difference principle. It's harder than they think it is to show that badly off people could not benefit from removal of the inequality. We can distinguish between two kinds of inequalities. First, there are those that relate to particular features of small-scale situations where everything is, as it were, pre-structured. The parameters of choice are fixed by the larger context in which the situation occurs. An example would be a situation in which only a small number of patients could benefit from an already produced expensive drug and you have the choice either of maintaining 
some kind of equality of provision across the set of patients or of having a severely unequal provision. There's no way of using the resources e evenly spread across the population of patients because the drug has already been produced and it's not, un it's not uh, deconstructible and recombinable in a fashion which will give some kind of equality of benefit. Now, by contrast with that, where a whole lot of structuring has already occurred to produce a resource which can either be used or wasted, as it were, there are these society-wide macro inequalities that concern political philosophy. And my hypothesis, which would certainly be false if applied to inequalities of the first or local type, is that the large inequalities can appear beneficial to or neutral towards the interests of the badly off only when we take for granted structures and attitudes that no one who affirms the difference principle should regard as acceptable. Now, if that hypothesis is correct, then we might, in the end, in a roundabout way, vindicate the application of the term egalitarian to the socialists that I have in mind. For we might say that a person is an egalitarian if he both affirms the difference principle, that is, if he thinks inequalities are justified if and only if they do not hurt the badly off, and he also believes that what that principle demands in practice is equality itself, if that is, the person thinks that there are no inequalities that do not harm the badly off. So equality appears in socialist rhetoric at first to be a premise. I think if you then think the matter through a little, it has to be rejected as a premise, as an ultimate premise, when the reason for wanting equality is clarified. It has to be rejected in favor of the difference principle. But if my conjecture that I've tried to characterize is correct, then grounded in the difference principle, it reasserts itself as a conclusion. So misidentified as a premise, it returns as a conclusion. I've now reached section two on your handout. Uh, I shall talk about Rawls and the difference principle on Thursday. Right now, I want to return to the less philosophical context set for us by Nigel Lawson's tax cut and to the incentive case against cancelling it, which is a case for maintaining rewards to productive people at the existing high level at the margin. And I shall consider that case only as it applies to those who, so it is thought, produce a lot by exercising skill and talent as opposed to by investing capital. There also exists an incentive argument, and indeed, economically, no doubt a more important one, for high returns to capital investment, but I'm not going to address that argument in these lectures. The argument I shall examine has purchase not only in capitalist economies, but also in economies without private ownership of capital, such as certain forms of market socialism. Proponents of the incentive argument in the restricted use of it that I'm considering say that when productive people get ordinary pay, they produce less than they otherwise do, and as a result, relatively poor and badly off people are worse off than they are when the exercise of special talent is well rewarded. Applied against a restoration of top tax to 60%, the argument runs in the reconstruction of it that seems to me faithful, um, as you've got it on the handout in number two. Public policy should make the worst off people materially better off. We can call that the major premise, normative premise. Then there's the factual claim that when the top rate of tax is 40%, the talented rich produce more than they do when it's 60%, and the worst off are, as a result, materially better off, or there's an opportunity for making them better off. And so top tax should not be raised from 40 to 60% in deference to the interests of the badly off people. Now, I'm going to comment negatively on this argument. But my critique of it will take a peculiar form because I'm going to focus directly not on the argument itself but on the character of certain utterances of it. 
Accordingly, I shall not raise questions about the validity of the argument or about the truth of its premises, save in so far as they arise within the special focus just described, a focus on certain people uttering this argument to certain other people. And I shall not, therefore, in particular, pursue possible doubts about the minor factual premise of the argument. I'm not going to question the claim, part A, that supposedly talented rich people are likely to be more productive if they're more generously rewarded. And I'm not going to question claim B, that the badly off would be likely to benefit from the greater productivity of the well-off affirmed in part A of the minor premise. I mean, socialists would have knee-jerk uh, skepticism about the factual truth of that premise that I, as a matter of fact, don't share, but whether or not I share it is irrelevant here. I'm simply taking it as something that's not going to be questioned. If you have faith in the minor premise of the incentive argument, nothing in these lectures is designed to disturb your conviction. So, part three. I've said that I seek to discredit the incentive argument by focusing on certain utterances of it. Let's hope that the Diet Pepsi tin doesn't explode. I'm very grateful to the construction of the tin here. Thank you for your patience. Um, the reason why I'm going to focus on certain utterances of it is that I believe that although the argument may sound reasonable enough when it's presented as it usually is, and as it was in section two, in a blandly impersonal form, it doesn't sound so good when we fix on a particular presentation of it in which a talented rich person pronounces it to a badly off person. And the fact that the argument undergoes this devaluation when it takes that particular interpersonal form should affect our assessment of the nature of the society that the incentive justification recommends. Now, it may seem strange that an argument should wear one aspect rather than another because of who utters it. So let me offer a fairly obvious example of this phenomenon. Consider the argument for paying a kidnapper, where the child will be freed only if the kidnapper is paid. Well, there are various reasons for not paying the kidnapper. Some concern the knock-on consequences of paying. Maybe, for example, more kidnapping would be encouraged. And paying could be thought wrong, not only in some of its consequences, but in its nature. Paying, after all, is acceding to a vile threat. You will nevertheless agree that because so much is at stake, paying the kidnapper will often be justified. And the argument for paying the kidnapper, shorn of qualifications needed to neutralize the countervailing reasons which I mentioned a moment ago, might run as we have it in, uh, near the top of section three, children should be with their parents. Unless this kidnapper is paid, he will not return this child to its parents. So this child's parents should pay this kidnapper. Now that form of the argument is entirely third personal. In that form of it, anyone might be presenting it to anyone. But let's now imagine the kidnapper himself addressing the child's parents. The argument in the second form that you've got on the sheet there is the same as the argument as that I originally rehearsed by an unimpeachable criterion of identity for arguments. The major premise states the same principle and the minor premise carries the same factual claim. So again, we have children should be with their parents. This time, I shall not return your child unless you pay me, so you should pay me. Well, notice now that despite what we can assume to be the truth of its premises and the validity of its inference, Discredit attaches to anyone who, meaning what he says, utters this argument in that interpersonal setting. Even though uttering the same argument in impersonal form is, in most cases, an innocent procedure. And of course, there's no mystery about why the argument's presenter attracts discredit in the exhibited interpersonal case. He does so because the fact to which he appeals which is that you will get your child back only if you pay, is one that he deliberately causes to obtain. He makes that true, and to make that true is morally vile. Now, in the argument just displayed, the kidnapper argument, there are two groups of agents. There's the kidnapper on the one hand, the parents on the other, both referred to in the third person in the initial presentation of the argument, 
and referred to in the first and second persons in its revised presentation. Consider now any argument that refers to two groups of people, A and B. There are many different ways in which such an argument might be presented. It might be uttered by members of A or of B or of neither group, and it might be addressed to members of either group or of neither. Well, if we had the time, the curiosity, and the energy, we could investigate all of these modes of presentation, and I think there are some interesting things to be said about different modes of presentation of different kinds of arguments. But in my treatment of the incentive argument, I shall mainly be interested in the case where a talented rich person puts it forward, sometimes no matter to whom, and sometimes where it matters that poor people are his audience. And at one point, I shall look at the opposite case, where a poor person addresses the argument to a talented rich one. That will be at the beginning of Thursday's lecture. Well, I'll get back to the incentive argument in a moment. First, a further word or two about the kidnapper argument, with which I shall later argue the incentive argument has something structural in common, even between kidnapping and withholding labor until one gets the money one desires. When the kidnapper presents the argument, he shows himself to be awful, but it's hardly necessary for us to reflect on his utterance of the argument to convince ourselves that he deserves our disapproval. Independently of any such reflection, we amply realize that the kidnapper's conduct is wrong, and if we are sure that the minor premise of his argument is true, we're not going to be particularly scandalized by his voicing it. Indeed, in certain instances, the kidnapper's presentation of the argument will be a service to the parents, because sometimes his utterance of the argument's minor premise will, for the first time, put them in the picture about how to get the child back. One can even imagine a maybe slightly schizoid kidnapper suddenly thinking, oh my God, I've forgotten to tell the kid's parents, and experiencing some concern for them and for the child in the course of that thought. Yet although what is mainly bad about the kidnapper is not his voicing the argument, but his making its minor premise true, he should still be ashamed to voice the argument just because he makes that premise true. The fact that in some cases he would do further ill not to voice the argument doesn't falsify the claim that in all cases he reveals himself to be ghastly when he does voice it. Well, I shall be looking at similarities and contrasts between the kidnapper and the incentive arguments. But first I need to say something about the word community, which appears in the title of these lectures. That word covers a multitude of conditions, and the particular condition that I have in mind is definable with respect to the presentation of policy arguments. Consider not normative arguments in general, but those which purport to justify policies that affect a distribution of benefits and burdens across groups of people. My proposal is that such an argument is consonant with the idea that the groups it mentions form a community only if it passes what I shall call the interpersonal test, which tests the quality of the relations between people that the argument presupposes. If, moreover, all arguments for the policy in question fail this test, then the policy itself violates community, whatever else might nevertheless be said in its favor. The idea behind the interpersonal test is that an argument justifying a distribution across groups of people in a society is consistent with community in that society only if the argument could serve as a justification of the distribution when uttered by any member of the society to any other member. To carry out the test, we hypothesize an utterance of the argument by a member of one of the groups it mentions to a member of another mentioned group. If, because of who is presenting it to whom, the argument could not serve as a justification of the distribution, then the argument presupposes lack of community within the society in question in respect of the distribution in question. It doesn't mean that the argument isn't a good argument for the policy, but it's a good argument on condition that it's accepted, which may simply be true, that relations among people in the society have a certain character, precisely the character which makes it true 
that this argument can't be presented by some of the people in the society to others in a credible fashion. One way that arguments fail when put to this test is that the speaker cannot justify a premise that either does not need or readily receives justification when the argument is presented impersonally. So, to anticipate what I shall try to show, the incentive argument does not serve as a justification of inequality on the lips of the rich because they cannot answer a demand for justification that naturally arises when they present the argument. Namely, to, to return to the particular context with which I began this question, why do you require a 40% tax rate as a condition of working that hard? Why are you going to slacken off if we put the tax back up to 60%? Because they cannot, so I shall argue, supply a satisfying answer to that question, advocacy by the talented rich on incentive grounds of a low tax rate is not congruent with their being members of the same community as badly off people. The rich will find that question difficult whether or not badly off people in particular press it, but in my limited time I shall concentrate on the case where badly off people form their audience because it makes the justificatory problem more poignant. The word community is used to mean various things. And you may or may not agree that the interpersonal test specifies a condition of community in one good sense of that term. There shouldn't be a debate about whether um, this test sp uh, specifies a condition of community in some agreed antecedent sense. It's supposed to semi-define a sense of community. There has to be a debate whether the test is interesting, of course, and you're entitled to think that it isn't. But in the sense that I have in mind, a society, just by stipulation, is a community only if the people in it can be of common mind with respect to the justification of the basic structure of their society. And if people are capable of common mind with respect to that justification, then there should be no strain in anyone rehearsing the justification to anyone else. The interpersonal test focuses on an utterance of an argument, but what it tests through examination of that utterance is the argument itself. That someone would display a lapse of community in uttering a policy argument says something about the argument, which is true of it no matter who utters it. Since the rich show lack of community, I'll argue, if and when they present the incentive argument, anyone who affirms it represents relations between rich and poor as at variance with community. It follows, if I am right, that the incentive argument can justify inequality only in a society where interpersonal relations lack a communal character in the specified sense. Well, sometimes, as for example in the kidnapper case, the interpersonal test will just be a roundabout way of proving an already evident point. In the kidnapper case, the evident point is that there's significant lack of community between the kidnapper and the parents. But in other cases, the test will illuminate, and if I am right, the incentive argument is one such case. There seems little untoward in the incentive justification when it's presented in the familiar, impersonal way. But so I believe the argument loses its appeal when talented rich people themselves utter it, for they then reveal themselves to be rejecting community with the poor in respect of the economic dimension of their lives. Now an important qualification. I say that the incentive argument shows itself to be repugnant to community when it is offered on its own by well-off people. I insert that phrase, on its own, because my case against the argument lapses when the argument appears in combination with claims about desert or with Nozick-like claims about a person's entitlements to the rewards his or her labor would command on an unfettered market. I do not myself accept the sort of compound justification which I have in mind here, but I don't contend that it fails the interpersonal test, even though I'm convinced that it's mistaken because the relevant criteria of desert and entitlement are indefensible and or inapplicable to the case in point. 
But such an argument doesn't fail the interpersonal test because there's something the wealthy person can say when asked what explains, what justifies his or her unwillingness to work as hard at 60% tax as they do at 40%. In any case, I won't be criticizing compound justifications. Here, my target here is the unadorned or naked use of the incentive justification, and it often is used nakedly, and with plenty of emphasis that it is being used nakedly. That emphasis occurs when advocates say it is an advantageous feature of the incentive justification that it employs no controversial moral premises about desert or entitlement. Notice that since John Rawls rejects use of desert and entitlement to justify inequalities, the Rawlsian endorsement of incentives, which I discuss on Thursday, takes what I shall call a naked form. Section 4. The kidnapper argument discredits its advocate when the kidnapper puts it forward himself because, as I said, he makes it true that the parents get their child back only if they pay, and to make that true is morally vile. Accordingly, to discredit first-person affirmation of the incentive argument in a relevantly parallel way, I must defend two claims. First, that in a sufficiently similar sense, the rich make it true that they will not work as hard at 60% tax as they do at 40%. I have to show that the minor premise of the incentive argument, strictly part A, but I'll speak of the minor premise when I mean part A of it. I have to show that the minor premise of the incentive argument owes its truth to the decisions and intentions of the rich. And it also needs to be shown that deprived as they here are of recourse to the considerations of desert and entitlement that are set aside in a naked use of the incentive argument, the rich cannot justify making the stated proposition true. I'm not obliged to maintain, even then, of course, that their making it true puts them on a moral par with kidnappers, but just that if their posture is defensible, then it's defensible only on grounds of the sort that a naked user of the incentive argument forswears. So I turn to my first task, which is to show that the talented rich do make the factual premise of the argument true. So let's ask, if that premise is true, then why is it true? Is it because the rich are unable to work at 60% as hard as they do at 40%? Or is it because they are unwilling to work that hard at 60%? If the truth of the premise reflects inability, then we can't say in the relevant sense that the rich make the premise true. An inability explanation of the truth of the premise means that they could not, by choosing differently, make the premise false. Well, there are two forms that the inability claim might take. In the first form of the claim, the rich cannot work hard unless they consume things that cost a great deal of money. Now, it might well be true that without enough money to buy superior relaxation, some high talent performances would prove to be impossible. Perhaps the massively self-driving executive does need to be effective. More expensive leisure between one day's work and the next than he would get living in modest accommodation on an average wage. But the income gap which that consideration would justify is surely only a fraction of the one that obtains even at 60% top tax. The extra money which executives and so forth get at 40% is surely not required to finance whatever luxuries we might imagine that they strictly need to perform at a high level. They could afford those necessary luxuries with what they have left even when they pay a 60% tax. In a different version of the claim that the rich could not work as hard at 60% as they do at 40, what they are said to need is not the goods that only a lot of money will buy, but the prospect of getting those goods or that money. The high reward is now said to be indispensable to motivation or morale. You eventually give the biscuit to the performing dog so that the same procedure will work again next time, and not because the dog needs the calories it gets from the biscuit, to enable it to go on performing. This motivation story doesn't say that unless they are offered high reward, the rich will choose not to work very hard, 
The proposition that they have a real choice in the matter is just what the inability claim is designed to contradict. What is rather meant is that the allure of big bucks sustains and is needed to sustain the motivational drive required for heavy effort. The rich just can't get themselves to work as hard when they know they will be taxed at 60% as they can get themselves to work when they know they will be taxed more attractively at 40%. Now, in my opinion, there's not much truth in this contention. It represents people of talent as more feeble than on the whole they are. It's not likely to be lack of power to do otherwise that causes the rich to take longer vacations or to knock off at 5 instead of at 5.30 or to forego trying hard to get one more order, which these are the things that they do when income tax rises if the minor premise of the incentive argument is true. By and large, the tax rise doesn't impair their power of choice. It just means that they make their choice facing a fresh schedule of the costs and benefits of alternative courses of action. I say that there's not much, not no truth in the contention mooted here because I recognize that a perception that reward is, so to speak, too low can cause, at least somewhat independently of the will, a morose reluctance which operates as a drag on performance. But we should ask what brings about such a disabling perception and the most likely causes of it serve to disqualify the second version of the inability contention as I shall now try to make clear. One thing that might cause a dispiriting feeling that reward is too low is simply disappointed expectation. Socialized as they have been in a severely unequal society, the talented rich of course anticipate a handsome return for their exertions. They may therefore be downcast when such return is not forthcoming, even when they do not judge that they deserve or are otherwise entitled to high rewards. But it's not unlikely that they also do make judgments like that. They think that they have a right to golden rewards if they work hard, and so powerful is that belief that it can act as a further cause of low morale. It can make the thought of working hard at 60% tax fill the rich with a truly disabling dismay. Now, an incapacity to work hard that reflects habituated expectation or judgment of entitlement or both cannot count here in rebuttal of the claim that optional decisions of the talented rich make the minor premise of the incentive argument true. Consider first the habituation factor. This evening I'm engaged in a ground level investigation of a certain justification of inequality. It's therefore inappropriate by way of contribution to that justification to cite mere habituation to unequal rewards. Unlike facts of human nature, habits are changeable and therefore beside the point in a fundamental inquiry. And insofar as it can be distinguished from the weight of sheer habit, the causal force of belief in the rightness of high reward must also be ignored here because we're here envisaging the talented rich uttering the incentive argument in its naked form in which invocation of entitlement is pointedly eschewed. There would accordingly be a kind of pragmatic inconsistency if the rich had to cite their own belief in entitlement when rejecting the claim that the truth of the minor premise of the argument reflects what they are themselves willing and unwilling to do. So I set aside the motivation variant of the inability claim. It doesn't furnish an appropriate reason for saying that the talented rich could not work as hard at 60% tax as they do at 40. If it is true, it's compromised in the present context by what its truth depends upon. It might help to exonerate the present generation of talented rich people, but it cannot contribute to a robust vindication of inequality in human society. And so having set the motivation claim aside, we may conclude that the reason why the minor premise of the incentive argument is true, if it's true, is that the executive and people like him are willing to work hard only at a 40% tax rate. But before we complete the procedure by asking the second question, which is whether that choice is justified, I have to address the complication that even if each talented individual chooses not to work hard at 60% tax, no such individual 
makes the minor premise of the incentive argument true, since its truth requires that many such individuals make similar choices. Here then is the disanalogy with the case of the kidnapper, since he makes the minor premise of his argument true all by himself. Well, in response to this important point, about which many things need to be said, I shall say only two things here. First, notice that an individual talented rich person is relevantly analogous to a member of a large band of kidnappers who could also, each, each of whom could also truthfully say, it will make no difference or not much difference if I change my choice. Yet if a member of such a band puts the kidnapper argument in the first person plural, if he says, giving us the money is the only way you will get your child back, then the fact that he is only one of the us who together ensure that the child is held captive does not make his posture innocent. And it is similarly true that if what the rich together cause could not be justified if one rich person caused it, then being only one rich person and not all of them would not make one's behavior innocent. One might not be as responsible as when one achieves something without assistance, but one also could not say that the result had nothing to do with one's actions. And whatever the complex truth may be about individual responsibility for a collectively produced result, I'm not here primarily interested in commenting on the moral character of individual rich people. My primary interest is in an argument which I claim fails the interpersonal test. It is consistent with what I want to contend that no rich person ever actually utters that argument and thereby incurs the special odium I say attaches to its utterance by rich people. A person may benefit innocently from an unjustifiable situation. If we counterfactually imagine that person trying to justify the situation in a certain way, which is what I'm doing, then what we're investigating is not whether the person's innocent, but how good the contemplated justification is. So finally, part five. Our premise says that if top tax rises to 60%, the talented rich will work less hard than they do now when top tax is 40%. And we've concluded that that's because they will then choose to work less hard. As a result of that choice, the badly off will be worse off than they were before, by the truth of the minor premise of the incentive argument. And a fortiori, they'll be worse off than they would be if the talented rich maintained at the 60% tax the effort they put in at 40%. On the factual assumptions, Behind the minor premise of the incentive argument, the ordering of benefit to the badly off from the three work tax packages that I just mentioned is the ordering that's given in the handout at the beginning of section five. Where W stands for the amount that the rich choose to work at 40% and X, the amount by which they reduce their input if the tax rises to 60%, the best thing for the poor is for the talented rich to work W at 60%, which is what they're not going to do. The next best thing is for them to work W at 40%, which is what they will do at 40. And the worst is for them to work less than W, W minus X at 60, which is what they would do at 60. What well, we now have to ask whether the choice of rich people to make three rather than one true if the tax rises, and thereby to make the badly off worse off rather than better off than when tax is low is justified when notions of desert and entitlement are not allowed to figure in justifications. Well, in certain cases that I shall call cases of special burden, the choice the rich make would undoubtedly be justified. Special burden cases are ones in which working just as hard at 60% tax as one did at 40% means living an oppressive life. Think of a harried and haggard yuppie who really would have a miserable life if the massive amount of work that he does were not compensated by the massive amount of income that leads him to choose to work that hard. We can set such cases aside, not because there aren't any, but because of the nature of the justification of the talented rich person's choice in this sort of case. Let me explain. In the present exercise, the incentive argument 
that I'm examining is supposed to justify inequality. But when special burden is invoked, what we get is not a justification of an inequality, all things considered, that incentives produce, but a denial that they do produce an inequality, all things considered. That is so because when we compare people's material situations, we must take into account not only the income they get, but also what they have to do to get it. Accordingly, if the talented rich could plausibly claim special burden, the move to the 40% tax which induced them to work harder also preserved, or perhaps even created for the first time, equality. In the special burden case, the work of the rich is specially arduous or stressful, so higher remuneration is here required as compensation for the sake of equality itself on a sensible view of how to judge whether or not people's situations are equal. Since I oppose only those incentives that induce genuine inequalities, my opposition retires in face of the special burden case, and I acknowledge that where special burden holds, the rich have a persuasive answer to the question why they make the minor premise of the incentive argument true. Now, my primary target as a philosopher is a pattern of justification, from which I've just argued the incentive argument deviates when special burden holds. But as a politically engaged person, I also have another target, the real world inequality that is actually defended on incentive grounds. And because I also have that second target, I have to claim that the special burden case is statistically uncommon. But I do not find that difficult to do, since I am confident that if talented rich people were to provide at 60% tax, the greater effort that they say they supply at 40%, then a large majority of them would still have not only higher income, but also more fulfilling jobs than ordinary people enjoy. Since I propose to cast no doubt on the truth of the minor premise of the incentive argument, I must now set aside another case, namely the one in which well-paid, talented people so enjoy their work, or are so dedicated to making money, that they would actually prefer to work no less hard after a tax rise. Such people engage in threat or bluff when, in the hope of inducing a political effect, they announce that a tax rise would lead them to work less. But in their case, and a fortiori in the case of talented people whose labor supply curve is in the relevant range, not merely vertical, but backward bending, which is to say that if they were to earn less per unit labor in that range, they would work more hours or put in more effort, in this sort of case, the minor premise of the incentive argument is false because these people will not work less hard if the tax goes up, and this case is therefore out of bounds here. So summarizing and extending this discussion, I now ask you to look at the table which appears on the final page of the handout, and which depicts three positions that the talented rich person might be thought to be in. Of the three cases that appear in the table, two are, for different reasons, the ones I've just reviewed, irrelevant to our purposes. The special burden case, because it poses no problem for the egalitarian point of view, and the threat or bluff case, because there the minor premise of the incentive argument is false. So from now on, we'll focus on what's called the standard case in the table. In the table, as before, W denotes the amount which the rich actually work at 40%, and W minus X denotes some significantly smaller amount. In all three cases, the rich prefer working W at 40% to working W minus X at 60%. The preference may not be readily apparent, but we can demonstrate that they have that preference because they choose to work W rather than W minus X when the tax is 40, and they must prefer W minus X work at 40 to W minus X at 60 because work is the same and income is higher when the tax is lower. So it follows that they, they prefer working her harder at 40% to working less hard at 60%. The preference orderings of the rich are the same in what I call the standard and special burden cases, the difference between those cases, which is formulated in parentheses at the bottom, just lies in the comparison between the lot of the rich and that of other people when the rich are at the bottom of their preference ordering. This comparison reflects both income level and quality of work experience. 
were they to work as hard at 60% as they do at 40, the rich would, in the special burden case, be worse off than others are, but in the standard case, they would still be much better off than others are. The ordering of benefit to the badly off from the various work tax packages, which is given by the numbers in the column on the left and which is the same in all three cases, is based on the assumption that part B of the minor premise of the incentive argument is true, so W at 40 ranks above W minus X at 60, and on the further assumption that if the rich worked as hard at 60 as they do at 40, then that would bring still further benefit to the poor. And that's why W at 60 ranks above W at 40 with respect to advantage to the badly off. The interpersonal test has talented rich people themselves uttering the incentive argument. Now, for present purposes, the talented rich do not fall into the threat or bluff case in which the minor premise is false. They really do prefer to work less if tax goes up. If we follow a distinction that has found favor with philosophers, the rich do not threaten anything if they utter the incentive argument, since in the recommended distinction, you merely warn that you will do A when you are bent on doing A, independently of the leverage you get from saying you'll do it. Notice that in the recommended distinction between threats and warnings, an unusual kidnapper who likes children merely warns if he would actually prefer, for non-strategic reasons, to keep the child if he's not paid. This shows that if we accept the recommended distinction, then some non-threatening warnings turn out to be not very pleasant. So imagine now a set of highly paid managers and professionals addressing poorly paid workers, unemployed people, and people indigent for various personal and situational reasons who depend on state welfare. The managers are lobbying against a rise in tax from 40 to 60 percent, and this is what they say. Public policy should make the worst off people, in this case, as it happens, you, better off. If tax, top tax goes up to 60 percent, we shall work less hard, and as a result, the position of the poor, uh, your position, will be worse. So the top tax on our income should not be raised to 60 percent. Now, although these argument-uttering rich may not, for all kinds of reasons, count as threatening the poor, they remain people of superior income and form of life who could continue to work as now if tax rises to 60 percent, and thereby bring more benefit to the poor, while still being much better off than they are, but they refuse to do that. They say, in effect, we are unwilling to do what we could do to make you better off and yet still be much better off ourselves than you are. To take a relevant British example, we realize that at the present level of fuel allowance, many of you will be very cold this winter. If tax went up to 60% and we worked no less hard in response, revenue for fuel expenditure could rise and some of you who asks, given that you would still be much better off than we are if you worked as you do now at the 60% tax, what justifies your intention to work less if tax rises to that level? Because these rich people don't say that they deserve a lot because of their prodigious effort or merit more because of their higher contribution to production. There is in their approach no appeal to such controversial moral premises and many of them would think that being free of such premises, their argument is consequently less vulnerable. And they cannot respond by saying that the money inequality which they defend is necessary to make the poor better off, since it's they who make it necessary. And the question the poor put asks, in effect, what their justification is for making it necessary. The incentive argument does furnish the poor with a reason to accept the inequality that it recommends. The poor can take it that the rich are determined to sustain the intention that makes the argument work. But the argument can't operate like that for the rich themselves. They can't treat their own choices as just given. They need a justification not for accepting but for imposing the relevant inequality. They have to say why they insist on that inequality on pain of regarding themselves, if they don't want to say anything about it, as unaccountable to what are supposed to be fellow citizens. So they have to answer the question that the poor puts, put, namely what their justification is for making the inequality necessary, and I shall say more about that question and about ways of answering it and of avoiding it 
on Thursday. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I didn't have a chance to warn Professor Cohen that the Tanner tradition is very much in the interest of lively questioning after lectures, but he's game. And so let me invite uh, members of the audience to direct their questions at him. You, you don't mind fielding them yourself. Uh, I had a question at the end of section three before you went on to before you mentioned how or I know it's like our argument might Complicated matters. Do you specify what the counter argument Well, Nozick believes that um, your own labor power is your own morally rightful private property to do with as you wish and in respect of which you owe no obligation to anyone else. You have, as it were, with respect to your labor power, all the moral rights which, um, which you would have over a piece of external physical property if you had all legal rights. And therefore, if you're uh, not complaining about being taxed at all, uh, despite that, you're already being obliging and forthcoming in paying any kind of tax at all. In a fortiori, you're entitled to say that you're simply not willing to uh, give that much of yourself at the 60% tax. Now, um, this notion of entitlement over your own labor is a complicated and difficult idea which um, needs a lot of investigation and discussion. I'm simply saying that if, 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 you, if, you, if you introduce that, then the rich have an answer to the question why they're not going to work that hard at 60%. You see, the thing is, the thing about the incentive argument as I construct it, and I don't think it's an artificial construction. I mean, you could say, you know, it might, it might have been complained, well, somebody could say, well, of course, if you strip it down to those essentials and don't allow recourse to any ancillary consideration, it's going to fail. I don't think, that, the, however, that that construction is artificial because I think it is, that, it is used in that way by people who poo-poo notions of entitlement and desert. And I claim that they're implicitly relying on them in the restricted use I'm sorry, in the restricted egalitarianism which they affirm. I'm essentially claiming that the Rawlsian kind of egalitarianism is a totally unstable compromise, that it depends on conceptions of um, personal self-ownership of an attenuated kind, which are not really to the fore, but which are really playing a role uh, if, if, the, if the kind of critique that I'm making is going to be avoided. I mean, uh, if I'm right, the effect of my being right would be to polarize things somewhat in political philosophy, as it were. Can you start by saying what you agreed with? Yes. No, never mind. You mean, what do I mean by that phrase, combina in combination with claims about desert and entitlement? Exactly. Do you think that it gets somehow stronger than either of them are independently? I couldn't tell if that was your 
Well, yes, you see, uh, if you affirm that everybody is entitled to deploy their labor as they wish, that isn't by itself a reason for any particular tax rate. That just says whatever the tax rate may be, no one can be criticized for making their own labor-leisure trade-off, right? So uh, if, if, however, you say that there is that kind of entitlement over your own labor, and you also say that modulo that, within that restriction, we want to make the badly off as well off as possible, then together you can argue for an appropriate tax rate a maximining tax rate, as it was so called, one where that, that, that makes the bundle that the badly off get as large as possible, and you won't be exposed to the kind of critique that I am making, namely that the people whose behavior you're taking as parametric shouldn't be behaving that way. That is, whose behavior, you see, the, the normal way that economists think about this matter is that they presuppose that the economic agents are trying to maximize their own utility, but they, the economists, or advising the state authority, have different aims. They're trying to maximize some kind of function within that constraint. And uh, I'm suggesting that um, there, are certain there are certain possible tensions in this relationship because of this discrepancy of values. Now, that discrepancy goes away if you, um, if you endow the individual with certain rights over their own labor. Okay, can I ask a follow-up to that? The, the real objection I have then is how you're characterizing what the economists said, because you seem to have understood the claim for which that I'm going to work. Now, at a certain level, at the 40% taxation, at the 60% of what Sure, the psychological claim to use words like gross performance, dismay, motivation, choose, contingency, and choice. I suppose, and well, there is some, I've seen quoted a couple times, studies which show when you do raise tax rates, in fact, wealthy people spend the same amount of uh, hours in the office that they did before. But suppose somebody answered, look, it isn't a matter of what I, what I choose to go into the office 12 hours a day or 8 hours a day. But at a 40% tax rate, I'm going to look at investing in a, in a tuna factory and I do a cost benefit analysis and I discount it and I look at the risks and then I say, what will I have left? I'll take 40% off the top. Aha, it makes sense to do it. But if you take 60% off the top, it doesn't make sense to do it. So it's not really a matter of how far I'm going to work. Uh, this is not a question of your own personal reward. This is a question of the viability of a commercial venture. I mean, this this would this this is this is to do with uh, what sort of return this venture would have to generate to cover its cost. Well, I'm not trying to address. I mean, you know, it's a very important question: the question of uh, of what the conditions are for satisfactory capital investment and whether the only satisfactory way to run capital investment in a society is in a decentralized form of private individual decisions. It's something that I have no competence to discuss. It, you know, it's a complicated economic question and about which um, I don't have developed views. I have developed views that I'm trying to lay before you about the deployment of um, personal, personal um, talent in relation to rewards that the person takes home with them, uh, you know, um, whether it, in, in whatever form. And I'm simply not addressing the further question that you're raising. And I did say um, at the beginning that um, from an economic point of view, I'm sure that the incentive aspects of reduced taxes have more to do with investment of capital than they have to do with investment of greater labor input. But I'm simply interested in that second question. I do think that it has more general application. There are, there are around, as it were, market socialist proposals in which um, 
well, in, in, in more radical ones, in, in which capital is completely socially owned and some of those questions about taxation in relation to capital wouldn't arise, but nevertheless the issues that I am addressing would still arise. Um, Well, I mean, there's a fundamental issue about um, what the justification of an egalitarian perspective is, which I haven't addressed. I'll say a word about it in a moment, okay? What, what, my, my contention is made, I mean, what, what, what my whole case is um, addressed to thinkers of the liberal left who profess egalitarianism and say they only want to deviate from egalitarianism where that will benefit the badly off. And I'm saying that they're really untrue to that profession. That's what I'm saying. Now, um, you could find the idea of, a, of an egalitarian society repugnant. You could believe that if a person has more drive, imagination, talent than another person, then that entitles that person to a better lot in life as such, right? I don't believe that, but I'm not trying to um, attack that belief. I'm attacking people who share my disbelief in that, but yet in a contorted way stop short of following through on it in a way that I think um, appropriate. Now. With respect to the fundamental question of whether you have an egalitarian perspective or not, I think that the, that the deepest conflict in political philosophy is between people who think, like me, an egalitarian, that um, no one should be better off than anybody else by virtue of luck, where inborn talent is part of your luck or how you happen to be um, brought up in your society, etc. I mean, that's, I think that's the fundamental egalitarian belief and it's counterposed to a fundamental belief on the other side, which is that each person should have sovereign rights over their own person and what they do with themselves and how they function. And um, I think that both of those ideas have a lot of appeal and um, I don't think that um, at the moment anyway I can claim to um, be so profound and original and deep a philosopher as to be able to tell you why the first one should command more authority than the second. I'm sorry, I don't know if I've made myself clear there. If you suppose that the poor are that way because of indolence or whatever, there's no reason to structure taxation in a way that maximizes the take for them in the first place. You see? I mean, there's no reason to give, I mean, you've just given an argument for inequality which um, in its tendency contradicts the argument for inequality that I'm examining. I'm examining an argument for inequality that says it's good for badly off people. Your, the argument for inequality that you just affirmed 
says that um, the reason why the badly off people are badly off is not luck, but because they made certain choices um, at variance with the ones the rich make, right? Now, I personally don't agree with that, but it's not part of my intellectual project here to deny that. My intellectual project is to look at the argument that says, we don't believe these um, um, stories about um, the deserving poor, you know, the, uh, the, I mean, they deserve, the undeserving poor are the ones who deserve to be poor. That's what confused me. Um, uh, um, we just think that we care about the poor and we think that that the, the, the social priority should be to make the, 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 the badly off people as well off as possible and that's why we affirm the inequality because it does that. Now it's that that I'm going against. I'm saying that, I'm saying in effect that that justification of inequality doesn't work because um, if the people in the society really believed in it, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to be the inequality to raise the condition of those people. It can only work in a society where the agents in question don't really believe in the thing itself and that's why it's not a community. I mean, if you take them, if you take the talented rich people as exogenous to the society, then, then and only then, so I say, does that justification work? In other words, you're changing the subject. I mean, um, if you, if you believe that, that um, people are poor because of their own criticizable fecklessness and so forth, then you wouldn't affirm the argument for inequality that I am criticizing. Do you see what I mean? John? Well, I should say many people who are otherwise sympathetic to some of the stuff that I'm trying to do here think that I shouldn't use the word community at all. I'm not yet convinced and I'm still trying to stick with it and see whether I can get a persuasive notion of community. I mean, the idea that I'm using is that All, all, all I mean by people, first, first of all, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to provide a, um, a general characterization of what it means for a set of people to constitute a community because I'm only trying to provide a necessary condition of community in one minimal sense. That necessary condition being this, that in a, with respect to the arrangements that prevail in a community, whatever justifies them should be a pattern of justification that anyone in the community can give to anybody else. Well, look, maybe that's just not possible. You yourself admitted that there are these, these real differences uh, in these conceptions of justice and so forth. And that, that seems to be a part of the modern condition. So maybe what we have to do is come up with principles that we can live with even though we have these rather significant differences. Especially if those differences are part determined by your class background. Well, I'm not sure I know what we can live with, the phrase we can live with means here. Um, I mean, I do understand that people have different views about what the appropriate boundaries of a community are, and I'm not saying anything about that myself. I mean, um, the issue arises very much with respect to the North-South dialogue in our, on our planet and about whether I mean, some, pe some people might think that, um, I mean, obviously there could be patterns of argument homologous with this incentive argument which apply to north-south interaction where the wealthier countries could say, look, here is a deal whereby we can both benefit. There would be something in it for us and there will be something in it for you. And uh, we want... To do, we, and we're, we're suggesting this because we care about your plight, blah, 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 right? 
And then the, South, the representatives of the South around the table could say, if you really care about our plight, why are you giving so little, you know? I mean, why are you doing this in the context of maintaining debt burdens, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And at that point, some people might think it appropriate to say, uh, well, look, you know, we're a foreign country. We're, we're not part of the same society as you. We don't have the same obligations to you that subsets within our society have to one another, right? Now, I have nothing to say. I mean, I have sentiments about it. In fact, as you might predict, I, my sentiments are that the whole world should be one community in the sense of community that I'm trying to define, right? But I don't, I, haven't, I don't provide any argument for that. If somebody wants to say it's perfectly appropriate for rich and poor in Britain to be different communities and they don't owe one another justification of basic choices they make about how they live and so forth, I have no argument against that. I'm just trying to say that's going to be the cost of this incentive argument. And it's not a cost that actual proponents of that argument are going to want to pay, you see. So, I mean, so much of my contention is um, directed against a particular political constituency. It's hard for me in the context of this paper to answer questions that come from a position to my right, uh, uh, very, sorry, to the right of the, of the, of the, of the liberals that I'm criticizing. This is supposed to be a socialist criticism of, of left liberalism. And, um, and it's not one that, that therefore undertakes to vindicate left liberalism and or socialism as a pair of alter, of positions against positions to the right of it, you see. I'm going to suggest that we give John Perry the last question. Uh, okay. um, when I look at your kidnapper or argument, look at the second step, I shall not return your child unless you pay. Very difficult to read that as anything other than a statement of intention. But the kidnapper said, I shall not return your child unless you pay. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you what I intend to do. I mean, I would, you know, I intend to give it back, but I'm just noting So I didn't get the contrast. What, what, is it, what, is it, what is it that you think he isn't doing? He's not making a bland prediction. Is that what you mean? I said, I'm saying I find it very hard not to take a statement of intention. And only when we turn to your other argument. Now, in the particular illustrations you use, uh, I just say I'm all in favor of taxing English people very much. <laughs> Okay, they don't, they don't currently intend to make it true, but they know, they currently, they're currently aware that when the tax uh, rises, they will then form the intention to change um, their work input. Is that the point? No, it, it's never the fulfillment of an intention, or it's not the fulfillment of an intention that they have at the time when they make the argument. No, I've sneezed in my time, but no, no. Well, I don't have to give my general view, but um, I, I definitely think that um, that the only way to the only plausible way to understand the truth, if it is a truth and it's here assumed to be one, that they will work less hard if the tax rises, is that they will decide that it's not worth their while at that rate of return to put in that amount of effort. 
I mean, there's no other way, there's no other plausible way of taking it, whatever. Now, I, I do think there is a, I do think it doesn't follow, though this, this, this may not have been the point you intended, but it is a subtle and interesting one, and it is true that it doesn't follow that when they now say they will work less hard if the tax goes, it doesn't follow that they're now stating an intention. They may now be predicting an intention that they're going to have later, but I don't think that that, which, I, which, which, which turns out I think not to be your point, is going to make a big polemical difference because they can still be asked now to do a little bit of self-control with respect to what kind of intention formation occurs later. But we do have a disagreement, don't we, about... Uh, No, I don't see why that follows. Well, I don't see why I've committed myself to that. Let's start with let's start with the polemical context before uh, b b before seeing how general pr the, the principles about uh, human behavior are that I need to affirm. Right? The polemical context with which I start supplies me with the prediction. The argument that I'm examining says the rich will work less hard if the tax goes up to 60%. Now, you, if you want to say, as I got a whiff of a suggestion, you might be in the last thing you were saying just now, that that by itself is a bizarre thing to make any kind of prediction about how body people are going to respond to a tax change. No, I'm just going back to exactly what you said. You said that the second premise of each of the arguments states the same facts. That's right. Well, let's forget about threats and warnings because that's not really, I mean, that, that's um, a kind of color, a vocabulary with a coloring which we don't have to go into. I want to stay at the level of intention because I'm puzzled about what this disagreement is. I really am quite puzzled about it. Um, um, do you agree that when the tax that whatever a given tax is, when a person, if a person's in a position to decide whether or not to work overtime, let's make it simple, right? That the person's decision, that, well, that, that, that whether or not a person works overtime, where they have a choice with respect to that, objectively, the, the objective opportunity is there, that they make a decision with respect to that question. Sorry? No, but can't, can't, why can't we start where I wanted to start? I mean, you know, um, why, can't we, why can't we do it? Why can't I be Socrates? I mean... Okay, so do you think... I, I just want to see how strong the disagreement is. Do you not think that they decide to work less when the time comes, that that's a decision? Of course, but do you think that, do you think that people, I mean, well, let, let, I mean, you know, let's, let's, I mean, suppose that, 
I mean, I could, I could construct some kind of uh, function from how much you work to how much you'll get right now, right? And you'd be able to tell me, wouldn't you, how you'd be likely to respond to a schedule of returns to various labor inputs. Yeah, but isn't, aren't those reactions, which are the units of that evidence, themselves cases of people making decisions in the light of costs and benefits of various courses of action that uh, confront them? I don't, I don't understand. It's conceivable that every human being always would make decisions in certain ways about their own uh, lot and what they're going to do, but that's just not true because human beings decide on very different bases. I mean, some, some people do decide, you know, I mean, universities introduce incentive schemes and merit pay and some people queue up quickly and others disdain it and think that they, that the institution should keep the money and use it for more socially uh, valuable purposes. If, these, if, if, it, if this is supposed to be some kind of uh, um, universal statement about human nature, it's simply false. Well, that could be, but that Yes, I am. Yes, but, you know, I just but but nevertheless, the actual the actual falsehood of the premise has a bearing on the content of what's being assumed when you assume it's true, because if the premise is false for the reason that I've given, then when you assume it's true, what you're assuming is true is that people will decide in a certain way. So there is a relevance of my, as it were, uh, unofficial view that it's false. In, in its perfectly universal form. I, I think it's true as a generality, but it's very important that it's false as a universal truth. If you want to take it that, that it's supposed to now to say every human being that is ever confronted by a situation like this will always decide in this fashion. Now that's something I haven't contemplated. No, I'm just saying that it seems the crux of your argument No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. What I believe, I do believe that it's always expressive of an intention and I don't say that such an intention violates community. I say that um, an unwillingness to um, say anything in justification of such an intention violates community. If somebody actually believes in entitlement or desert, even if those beliefs are false, and puts those views forward in answer to the question, they don't violate community in my sense because they've given an intelligible answer. I don't have to accept that answer to say they haven't violated community. The people who violate community are the people who have the spare the sparse Rawlsian justificatory resources and then make the uh, incentive argument. I think I'm going to suggest that uh, if Professor Perry wishes to have the last word, he uh, sees the opportunity in a moment. Uh, I want to ask the audience to uh, join me in thanking Professor Cohen not only for a stimulating lecture but for a candid and generous exploration of views afterward. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Beautiful patient. That was nice.